All right, everybody, welcome to part two, we're going to call it, of the uh, podcast that we have decided to put together. Uh, I believe that we decided uh, in the interim that we're going to call this Pop Goes the Zebra, uh, simply because, yes, we're referees, yes, professional wrestling is um, our platform, but as we kind of said in the other episode, this is not just going to be a wrestling podcast. This is going to be a wrestling show where we also talk about what we're into and, and we go, we'll do a deep dive. Uh, Before we started recording, we're, we're just going to spill the beans. Now we, we decided we're going to do an episode about our love of the Titanic and, and all the, all the cool stuff that we know about it. So yeah. uh, With that being said, once again, I'm your host, Jeremy Telema, Jeremy, the ref. And of course, with me, nah. the uh, ever ev- ever crippled uh, Jesse Fields, ever crippled. Oh man! Wow. I hope we don't get like nailed for that. Anyway, Jesse, how uh, how you doing, man? I'm all right. Uh, doing good. Uh, it's raining here at home, which uh, par Is for it? the course where I'm at. But uh, it's a good good day. There you go. There you go. Good, good uh, it's raining it's raining for you here it's snowing i think we're supposed to get like another 12 feet of snow overnight but you know <laughs> bust out your snow speeders and watch out for wampas i was um, like what do you what do you want hoth sometimes it's northwest indiana bro um so uh in this uh this part of the uh the show we're we're, we're gonna kind of piggyback off of what we did in the last episode uh uh just to recap we talked about how we started uh, we both kind of had the, uh, the shirt thrown at us here, try not to suck. And it, and it, you know, obviously took off for us from there. And today, I think, uh, just off of that, that's probably the best topic to talk about, uh, out of the gate would probably be, you know, where we're at now, what, what came of that, uh, uh after here, don't suck. So Jesse, you know, you got, you got into your first promotion and the name, escapes me i i apologize pardon me you uh you got you got in your first promotion uh what when did you start branching out and where did you start branching out into and how did how did that all happen um i was with uh tony fox uswo for i think it's about four or five months and i got asked at some point i I, and course my memory's fuzzy about all the details but uh there was a promotion running um in a town just north of nashville called millersville and the promotion was called uh southern all-star wrestling saw and they were doing tv they were doing their you know local access tv stuff and i was asked to come up there and and start refing with that and not long after i came up there there was a change in management um and the promotion got a big overhaul and was eventually called showtime all-star wrestling and it ended up being uh sort of the platform for me starting to travel uh because they would do tapings in different towns and i'd learn to like hey let me hop in this car and ride with you the taping and uh it for a while it was probably the biggest local uh wrestling show uh, in Nashville. And of course, you know, that got me onto like an NWA show, uh, NWA main event, which ran out of Nashville and NWA top rope, which was another show just outside of Nashville. And it just kind of grew from there. Um, word of mouth, like, Hey, you know, he's a, he's a good referee. We can use him on this and we can use him on that. So it's, that's kind of what got me, uh, moved around. Um, I really didn't get to do the the big travel till the last couple of years, which I kind of regret. I, I could have hopped in cars many years ago and, and probably worked some amazing shows. Just didn't do it. And, you know, I feel like we should, we should touch on that. Like you should get as much work in as you possibly can, but the option to travel isn't always there for everybody be it because it's you know it's just not feasible in terms of there's just no opportunities themselves or you know just just balance of life versus career i mean i think that is important to some degree you know not everybody can can 
put it all on black and spin the roulette wheel. You know, we all have jobs and responsibilities and, and personal lives that we have to take care of. So like, I, I just, I, for those of you watching that are like on the, on the teeter totter, but oh, should, I, should I just risk it all and go for it? Or should I, should I play it safe and just, you know, take the safe opportunity in my personal opinion and take it for what it's worth. I, yeah, there's no right or wrong answer you you do what works for you you know if you have a gut feeling one way or the other follow it because it's probably right but uh yeah i just you know you said you didn't want travel as much as you wanted to and i i just thought of that but uh you said that uh you started going other places uh when did you start really feeling comfortable uh in your refereeing it is like you know i i'm I, i've definitely got something going here I think probably after the first year or two, um, I suffered an injury in 2007. Uh, I broke my spine in a roof construction accident and I was hindered for about four or five months and slowly came back to roughing. And I went right back to Saul. Uh, they welcomed me back with open arms, uh, went back working with them. And, um, I was able to start getting my ring time and, and start working places more. And I think when I really, really started feeling comfortable, it's probably about the two or three year mark where I felt like, okay, I think I know what I'm doing now. I think I've got a slight hold on it. Um, you know, just hopefully not screwing up as much as I did when I first started out. And of course, now I look back on those days and I'm like, Ooh, I was wrong. <laughs> So I, when I started, uh, I was working at uh, a, a single promotion uh, out of a uh, city called, of Maryville, Indiana called Fire Pro Wrestling. And I was there for about four or five years and I'd get the occasional one-off shot other places. But um, what really opened the door for me was uh, by just a weird myriad of just happenstance um, I ended up uh, getting an opportunity to uh, do a House of Hardcore show out in Cleveland uh, for Tommy Dreamer's promotion, and that opened up some doors to me and gave me a little bit more credibility. Um, and I say credibility because back in the day, and I don't think it's as bad as it is now, but back in the day, there was this stench, if you will, of if you were from like Indiana and you tried to go into like Chicago or, or Michigan or whatever, there was kind of that, oh, Indiana, you know, which I never understood why. I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity there for everybody. Why are you holding something like where a person's from against them? They, you know, they can't control that. But anyway, you know, that helped me kind of break into the Chicago area. Uh, I started doing some some work for for AAW, um, and then from there uh, that turned into uh, Black Label Pro, and then it just kind of spread from there. I ended up um, I ended up at at, at Warrior, uh, I, and then Freelance and Freelance Underground. So I went from you know not a whole lot going on for me to having a lot going on for me over the span of like a year. And um, I still don't understand how it happened, but I'm very thankful and I feel very blessed that it happened because it, it changed my life and the way I look at just like, like normal everyday stuff, you know, how you approach your, you know, your work ethic at, at your job and all that. It gave me a better perspective and a way of dealing with things I might not have dealt with the right way beforehand. But that was that was kind of how it all happened for me. And uh, yeah, man, I, I couldn't be happier with, with how things have turned out. Yeah. And, you know, for better or for worse, like we go through a lot of experiences and we take just you have to look at it as, as an opportunity to learn whether it's a good a, a good situation or a bad situation. So and, you know, having the opportunities that you've been given and you just ran with it. You know, that's, that's all you can do. Um, some people don't even get those opportunities. 
No, they don't. And there's a lot of good good referees and good wrestlers out there that don't get the opportunities that they deserve. And it's not their fault. It just, for whatever reason, never happens. So yeah, if, you, if you're given an opportunity, always be thankful because it could easily have gone the other way. Yeah. And I, I have to remember that, like, there's a lot of times I feel like I don't deserve to do the things that I do or go the places that I've gone to, because I feel like there's people that deserve it more than me, but you know, the opportunity was presented to me or the situation came up for me. So it's, you know, if some, if it happened to somebody else, they would have done the same thing. They would have taken the opportunity and run with it. So um, I have to be very thankful for the opportunities I've been given because uh, there's not a lot of people that get to do uh, the GCW stuff. Um, I know that they can be very particular about uh, the type of referees they have. They want to have people who know what they're doing. They're going to do exactly what they're asked and they know that they're going to perform under pressure, perform under weird circumstances and absolutely give top-notch performance and uh i feel like any of us that have ever done anything with gcw that's that's kind of it's kind of what they want i will never forget my first and only death match nick gage and effie uh, <laughs> i i was scared to death because i don't uh i don't i don't uh necessarily like browbeat anybody that that goes in for death matches and things like that it's just not my personal you know my personal what i'm good at you know so i was put into a situation where you know i had to do this and i knew it was going to be a death match but i also knew that if you're going to do it why not do it with somebody like nick gage you know yeah i mean that you, if you're going to go if you're going to go do something go and do it big and uh yeah yeah i i could say the same thing i had never done a death match before and i was asked uh, I believe it was sometime in 2011 to do IWA Deep South's Carnage Cup, which is a two-day deathmatch tournament. I had never done that before. I went into that completely unprepared. Um, and it was a culture shock. I was like, whoa, these guys are doing this. Why? And uh <laughs> I mean, it, it was crazy. And, uh, you know, some of those guys are still working today. Unfortunately, some of them are no longer with us. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, we, we had talked about it on the last episode. Like, it's a flavor. Yep. It's, a, it's a movie genre. It might not be your thing, but there's a cult following for it. They enjoy that stuff. And there's the same thing can be said. Some of the talent absolutely love doing those things. Um. I, I'm either or when it comes to officiating it, I've done them. I'm a lot smarter now uh, wearing long sleeves, gloves, um, black BDU pants, combat boots to make sure I don't get my feet cut up or my legs cut up. So, you know, taking precautions, like I'm a lot smarter now than I was uh, refing in a short sleeve shirt and getting shards of glass to cut up my arm. Way to go. I would, just like to, I would just like to point out that I did all the wrong things in terms of how to dress for a death match, and I didn't get a single piece of glass. So, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a very different uh, counting style than I do, so that, that lends a lot to it. If you um, want to call it a style, <laughs> I just hit the ground hard. <laughs> i do too um but i remember going back and watching that and i think you and i knew each other through social media and i remember watching that going oh man he looks he looks like he's so out of place doing this <laughs> and it's I, out of I, water and i admitted it but you know it just how the how the uh, the card went that night and look if you like you know when you're faced with a challenge you, you either face it head on or you 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 run away and i'm not going to run away when you're given an opportunity you need to take that opportunity you may never know when that opportunity is going to come back around if ever and being featured in that type of spotlight you know for us as referees the spotlight's never going to be on us but there are people who will notice what we do and you know hey, that guy really conducted himself very well and was very professional, very well put together. I think he'd do really good on this you know, big television product. 
you know, you never know. Things like that could happen. And, right. you know, it's it's just al- always, always be ready to take an opportunity. Exactly. Opportunities are, are few and far between sometimes, and you got to be ready for them when they show up. Um, so you, you, you branched out into these other, uh, into these other promotions and things like that, but you had to have had some help along the way. Uh, who, who was kind of in your ear at that point? Who was, who, who was your, 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 your guiding light through the, the crazy world of the refereeing and professional wrestling world? Um, I, I've had multiple people help me at, at the very beginning. Um, a guy named Nick White was the other referee on the show that I, I debuted on. And he, I, he gave me his shirt and taught me how to do a few things. And we always had a friendship and he would always be like, Hey kid, um, I'm working for this promotion. I think it'd be really cool. You, you hop in the car with us and go. And he was also the person that exposed me to Chikara and ring of honor and this world of independent wrestling that I was completely oblivious to. So he, he was very pivotal, uh, very pivotal in uh, getting me going as a referee Um, for a while. It was just, you know, whatever wrestlers I was friends with uh, they'd help me, uh, you know, Oh, Hey, I, I, Jesse's a good ref, you know, I'll, I'll vouch for him and, you know, he, get him on the show. And it, that's kind of what helped me. Um, but the, the person who got into my ear the most about being a good referee was Rudy Charles. Um, I got very lucky to work with him at NWA main event. Uh, Mike Posey was there uh, at the time as well, because Bill Barron's with uh, NWA Wildside and, and he worked at TNA uh, was producing our show. So a lot of the Georgia guys, which was Corey Hollis, Mike Posey, and uh, Ryan Bishop, guys like that. I got to work with, like I said, Mike Posey and Rudy Charles, two guys from TNA. Uh, of course, Mike went on to work for WWE. Uh, he currently works with uh, AEW. Rudy, you know, he went from TNA and now he's in WWE. So like I had a great opportunity with those guys. Um, Rudy really guided me a lot. Uh, of course, I didn't want to take the guidance at the time, but now looking back on it, I'm like, okay, now I'm taking the guidance, uh, trying to hmm. correct some wrongs. But they, they, they were, they were the, the, some of the pivotal ones uh, um, to, to get me in the right direction. And uh, there was a lot of stuff. It was, I had to sink or swim myself. Uh, I had to reach out myself. I had to learn and get the confidence of like, uh, yes, I'd like to come work for your promotion. Here's a resume or here's a reference, you know, and, and I learned a lot of stuff myself. And uh, I now I try to do the same thing to younger talents. Like, hey, I'll vouch for this kid. You know, try, try to pay it forward. Exactly. And I think that's such a huge key to to um, a successful business in general. Uh, you, you just... <sighs> you have to watch out for the for the new guys because if you don't look out for them who's going to um because the new guy uh is going to look to you for guidance because you've been there before and if you are having and you got to be so careful with them because if you're having a bad day one of two things is going to happen that new guy is going to look at you having a bad day and they are going to either say, oh, so that's what I've got to be like. And, and they're going to go off on their own path of negativity. Or they're going to be like, oh, man, I don't ever want to be like that guy. And you've lost them right there day one. And it's yep. just such a vicious cycle. You have to be careful, but you have to look out for the young guys. Because without good veteran leadership, how is there going to be a next generation? And oh yeah, you know, I, I if, mean, if you don't look out for the next generation, you're not going to help continue the business once you're gone. Yeah, and, and and I, it's such a key thing. Like a lot of us that were the young guys never really thought we'd see ourselves as the leaders, and now, you know, 15, 16 years in, you're you're one of the leaders, and now you have the opportunity to teach and and 
to help grow. And I, I'm very lucky that uh, there's a couple of referees I get to work with very young. Um, they're definitely going somewhere. They're amazing. Um, one I have to shout out cause he's so good. Uh, shiny shoes, Aaron noise. Um, I work with him at TWE. I'll be working with him this upcoming weekend at new South. He's really branched out. Uh, I have him working with me at Kapow whenever he's available. He's hopping in cars and riding to shows knowing he may not get to work. Uh, he did, a, he rode down to Texas with, uh, uh, with some, some talent from Tennessee, got to work down there. He took a shot uh, at the collective, went up there, no booking at all, ended up working on several shows. Um, so it's like he, you know, see, he's seizing opportunities and, and with people like me and the veterans that he works with are, are fueling him saying like, Hey man, get out there. You got to get out there, you know, be seen. And um, it, it's good seeing young talent start to come up like that. Uh, you know, I've got to throw some names out there too, because I'm, I'm blessed to work with some guys that, you know, they're still relatively new to the business, you know, top of my head, you know, uh, Sam Meadowood, Nate Speckman, Dan oh, Perch, man. and I'm going to throw Xavier Franklin from Ohio out there. I haven't yeah. worked on a show with him yet, but I remember him from a seminar I did. And I'll tell you what, man, what keep an eye out for him he's going places he is going to be one of the premier referees on the on the circuit very soon so you know i see his name pop up so much now and that's that's good he's he's done the work man he's doing it the right way and he's got such a great attitude man i can't wait to see what the future holds for not only him but for all the all the zebras i've mentioned um but uh, for me, as far as veteran leadership went, it, it was kind of, I was kind of just going with the flow. I didn't really have a whole lot of guidance for as far as referees goes, because where I started, you didn't really have that grizzled referee that had, you know, attained, you know, achieved success across the board in other promotions, you know. So I just kind of picked the brains of the wrestlers, you know, just, you know, where do you want me? How do you want me to, you know, this, that, and the other, I didn't really start getting any guidance until, um, uh, one, uh, Tristan Hayes, uh, one of my very best friends, um, told me to reach out to this guy named Jason Ayers. And I had no clue who Jason Ayers was. I knew the name. I had no clue who he was. And, I, he was just a guy in my phone, you know, just that random Facebook ad, you know, and uh, because I trusted Tristan so much, I reached out and I just said, Hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a young referee. I'm trying to be better at this. Can you help me? And it, uh, a friendship just blossomed from there. And, uh, that, that really, really helped change the game for me and how, how I approach things. It made, it, it made my, my professional approach that much better. And uh, I went from just being a terrible referee that, you know, I, you know, you, you could only pass it off as I was a terrible referee because nobody taught me. Now I'm just a terrible referee and it's all his fault. So <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta love a, a good Papa Ayer story. Um, he knows I love him. You uh, know, I, uh, he and I actually don't, I've never really spoke to him a whole lot um there was a discussion in our referee group zebra talk um was a couple years ago it was about injuries and uh things that have happened and i brought up an incident that happened with me and he messaged me privately to talk about it and i thought that was really to me that was really cool like he he's he's with the top company and he didn't have to do that and um I, you know, just it, most of the interactions that we've had have always been, we're laughing about something or making a letter Kenny reference or, uh, you know, nerd reference. So it's, that's pretty much how oh, a lot of our conversation he is, he is the ultimate nerd, but oh, no, my it was, God. <laughs> it, you know, Jason Ayers, you know, the guidance through the cell phone, but what really the, the practical didn't come until I, I was introduced to uh, Brandon Toll and Jake Clemens. 
between those oh, toll. two. Oh, Brandon Toll. We actually hold on. I think I've got a card. I'm going to break open here for you. I got this uh, this uh, Juan Gonzalez card of the Texas Rangers here for you. Uh, that's I don't know, Brandon. If you could tell me if that's worth anything, please let me know. I'm in desperate need of cash. But <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta mess. I gotta get in contact. I, I gotta message I'm him. I'm messing with I you, got, Brandon. You know I love you. I got a whole bunch of baseball card packs for him. <laughs> hey, you know what? He's passionate about it, and that's awesome. That's what this show is about. It's not just about our wrestling passion. It's about okay. our life's passion. So, so, and you'll obviously remember how we kind of came up with this idea was we went back and forth on a Brandon Toll post because we started talking <laughs> Actually, hockey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, how, how many and, Stanley Cups you got right now? Just to and, refresh uh, my memory. Uh, anyway, uh, go on. And poor, and poor Toll's notifications were probably <laughs> going on like, what are these two idiots going on about? Oh, I guarantee you he <laughs> muted it within like 30, within what, like the first two tweets. I guarantee it was muted. Yeah, guarantee it. <laughs> but of course, it wasn't wrestling related, and it wasn't baseball related. So I know he wasn't gonna. I mean, yeah, you know what? He's a busy man. If he wants to mute that, that's fine. But you know, I digress. <laughs> we we love you, Toll. But um, I was yeah, waiting but... for him to, to chirp in about the the blues. Honestly, you know what? I am kind of disappointed. I thought he was a. I thought you were a blues fan. I, th- I thought you really we said it him. we set it up for the blue for him to come in with a blues reference but no no mm. nothing oh ah, well you know still Brother didn't get from the that cup hangover or something i don't know but uh, oh what are you what are you what are you doing there there jesse you don't know the first thing about a stanley cup hangover come on now come on now. i'm a remember i'm also a flyers fan so we've had a cup we've had a cup <sighs> But Not anyways, sure about this year, but you know. Uh, well, anyway, hey, come sit next to me on the Blackhawk bench. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, between Jake and Brandon, uh, it really helped. Um, it really helped kind of right the ship, it, you know, and, and give it a rudder. So, so now I I had a good blueprint between those three to to really kind of all right. Here's here is what successful referees look like here is how they approach it and here is how they rationalize everything that they do and that's helped me tremendously yeah um i'm sure rudy was the same way for you yeah rudy rudy didn't really cover a lot of stuff outside of the uh, outside of wrestling as in like how i needed to conduct myself when when talking to people he he was more of getting me better as a referee and once I hone my skills as a referee, then that's when you need to start approaching stuff. And, and I was sort of like an unfinished project. Um, I feel like he really put a lot of time and effort and I just, um, again, I was a dumb kid. I didn't appreciate it at the time. Uh, but I feel like in some aspects, like his project finally came to fruition when I started taking myself seriously and taking his advice and applying it to got to be more professional, got to worry about my conduct. I, the, I've got to learn and uh, not to be. Yeah. But because that's one of the biggest things and I'm still bad about it. The worst thing you can do in pro wrestling when getting feedback is yeah, but that's the big and not to get on the soapbox, but that's the biggest problem with society right now is where yeah, but society, if we just sit down mm-hmm and start listening instead of trying to talk past the next guy you'd be amazed what we can get accomplished but and and especially in wrestling if you just really sit down and listen to these veterans when they're trying to tell you something it doesn't matter if you like them or not it doesn't matter if they like you if someone is taking the time out of their day to impart knowledge brother take it it's 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 another opportunity seize that opportunity yeah uh, and i'm bad about it sometimes Uh, i'll be in my own world and i don't get it and then suddenly i'm like oh oh i shouldn't do that well then let me ask you this do you remember what rudy told you do you remember remember, all, all the things he told you i remember a lot of what he told me then he accomplished the mission that he set out in trying to impart knowledge in you as long as you are cognizant of 
you know what? I received it wrong at the time, but I'm still taking those lessons to heart. It's okay. Yeah, you know? Unfortunately, I had a lot of those lessons knocked out of my head, but you know. Well, you know, we, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> um, but uh, what I really wanted to uh, to touch on um, after all of that is is uh, now that we've talked about where we've been and what you know where we're at now, what if if I could uh, if I could ask where do you, we're, we're, we're kind of in the middle of winter now, but obviously we're all kind of waiting, especially in, in the northern half of the country, we're, we're all kind of waiting for the snow to melt so we can at least, you know, depending on how the pandemic is going, we can still kind of do outdoor shows and things like that. It'll warm up a little bit. Where would you like to be uh, uh, coming out of the pandemic? Where do you, where do you, what are you hoping to accomplish going forward with your career because you said you've, you've been in for 16 years that's a long time for a lot of people uh you know what are you looking to accomplish uh at, at this stage of your career what are you trying to get to the you know that's that's a good question i get asked that um anytime i do a, a discussion or podcast and it tends to vary <laughs> unfortunately uh depending on the mood i hard ideally subject to change <laughs> hard subject to change uh you know, I would really, before I hang up the stripes, I would like to be under contract in some degree uh, as maybe assisting in a backstage role, assisting with TV production, um, being an on-air referee. You know, my goal is to to have a contract. I, I want to make money doing wrestling. I've invested over half of my life, I have neglected family reunions. I've neglected family events. I've had relationships fall apart and I've had my body fall apart. I've had major surgeries. I've dedicated my life to the wrestling business and I would like for it to, you know, uh, be a source of income finally. In whatever capacity I could be under contract you know, I, I want to work for a company and make some money. And I think that that's probably the best that anybody could ask for. Uh, I, you know, I want to go to the very top. I want to, I want to be under contract. I want to go to WWE. I, you know, I want to have a life that I, that I can provide for a family and, and do what I love at the same time. But, um, that is not to say that if I don't achieve my goals, that I'm necessarily, I've necessarily failed because again, the careers that you and I have both had, if, if we, if we stopped tomorrow, you know, I think we could both be satisfied in what we've done so far, but obviously oh, absolutely. we want more. And, uh, if, you know, if, if that's not in the cards for me, I'm perfectly content with, with doing it for a few years and teaching helping teach that next generation of referees and kind of get them on the right path i'm perfectly perfectly content with that and then riding off in the sunset whenever that time may be um and 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 start a family so either way i'm good i you know i don't necessarily need to uh i don't i don't need but i still want if that makes sense yeah um I mean, I don't need it either. Uh, you know, last year, uh, towards the begin the beginning of the year, I was I was toying around with the idea of making 2020 the last year. Uh, my my body's been through a whole lot, and you know, it, I was just like, okay, <laughs> I, I was losing I was losing the the drive and the passion for wrestling, and then the pandemic happened, and I got to sit at home and I got to rest. And then I got to, okay, well, we'll, we'll see how this pans out. Maybe next year I'll make it the last year. And then an opportunity fell in my lap and then another opportunity. And then that passion started to come back and it started making me, okay, uh, so long as my body wants to hold out, I feel like I can get a few more years. I can get some more mileage out of this. And 
if I don't end up getting a contract, it is what it is. I, I've been very blessed to work on pay-per-view now. I've been blessed to, to work with some amazing names and to travel. And, you know, if, if that's, if I get to keep working GCW shows, a flight of Florida or a flight of Philly, fly to Jersey, come up to Chicago, go out to California, you know what? I can, I can live with that. That's, that's still, you know, that's still fun. It's, Hmm. it's still fun to me. The Philly trip was the first time I ever had to fly to a town to do a wrestling show. That was my first wrestling flight. It was amazing. I was so excited to do it. And that's what keeps me going is that excitement. Oh man. I, I remember going out to the collective, uh, in New York, uh, the the most fun that i had on that trip had nothing to do with what i did inside of a wrestling ring it was that thursday night i was there i went running around manhattan with some of my closest friends and i saw the pictures i've often i've often said that that was the best night of my life in the wrestling business but um the uh you were you were talking earlier about opportunities and things like that i was the same way i at one point i said i was going to be done at 30 if nothing ever you know if i never got a like a like a uh, like a, a serious opportunity to to better myself you know outside of the the little 20 mile bubble i was working and the house of hardcore thing happened and i was like okay well let's see what happens here you know all all hands on deck and then the next thing happened and the next thing happened and before you know it i was i was on the rotation for nlw in chicago before the pandemic shut us down and i was doing evolve seminars and you know being named the senior official at warrior which you know you know so it's just funny you, you start to kind of put that all right this is the line in the sand and if i cross it that's it and it, it you know it's kind of you're, you're chasing the dragon it's like all right i'm done okay i guess i'm not i'm gonna keep going another couple more so right now my my line in the sand is 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 40 but you know <laughs> i i have retired probably five times i have yeah. retired five times and they come out of retirement and it's um yeah it's it's one of those things like um, for a long time, my goal was, I want to work Chikara. I want to work at King of Trios. And the first time, the only time I got to work for Chikara, I worked on King of Trios. There you go. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, what comes after this? So then I had to find, okay, what's the next goal? GCW. I was like, well, let me try to get on GCW. Here I am. <laughs> so now it's like, what's next? What's the next, uh, what's the next thing for me to do? Um, you were talking about that, the uh, collective in New York. Um, I really wanted, I almost, I was on you about that too. I said, you, gotta you were get on there. me about it. I, I wanted to, and something had happened and I was unable to make that trip. I think you were and hurt. Was, no. Or you had, you, was I hurt? that or you had something personal come up? Yeah, I, I couldn't make it. And then I was like, okay, next year. And then they announced it in New Orleans, and that's no, it was, that was Tampa. Or was it Tampa? Yeah, it was last year. Yeah. Okay. So New Orleans was the year before. Yeah, I was New do, Orleans I was, was the year before New York. And I was going to do that, but you had to get a license, and I just uh, I did not want to mess with the athletic commission. I, and then I don't remember what kept me from doing New York. I think I you really, were hurt. I think you were hurt maybe i was hurt or you were you were you were like you weren't hurt but you were still feeling the effects of the recovery if uh, I'm it, it, might, it, might, it was something it like might have been post it was the post surgery it might yeah. have been post surgery because i ended up doing i think it was around that time i did the impact seminar slash tryout with chris levin brandon toll and john capital e period bravo <laughs> that man was shot sir he is a national hero he survived that that man I, you know what? I love me some John Bravo. He is just John absolutely e. Bravo. The, the, the way he introduced himself. My name is John capital E period Bravo. And that, I just, that might be my favorite introduction in the history of introductions right there. At, at that moment, I'm like, this dude's awesome. I, ah. I will listen to everything this guy has to say because of that delivery. And I, I, 
literally I did that seminar the day after I was cleared to come out of my sling from shoulder surgery. So I think it, uh-huh. it was, it was around that time where I didn't want to work shows directly because of the shoulder. That's gotcha. what, you know, what, cause that I'm sitting, I'm sitting right. here trying to think and then Tampa and I was going to Tampa. I was, well, I was, we were like, all oh, going to Tampa. We were all going to Tampa and then 2020 happened. Yeah. That thing. <laughs> We don't, we don't talk about that. We don't, we don't talk about yeah, that. We're not talking about that anymore. But, uh, you know, uh, I feel like uh, we, we covered the topics that we wanted to hit on this. So I think the best way to probably wrap this story up, and I know I'm kind of putting the, the, the gun barrel to your head, but if you got a good road story, now mm. now is probably the best time to kind of start racking the files of, the, of your brain and come up with one uh because obviously some of the best parts of wrestling is the is the stories uh, of about the characters and the situations that you encounter on your travel oh boy um i actually do i've got i've got quite a few road stories um nothing incriminating though we're not no no to out uh, anybody you know no i i don't know and so uh, had a goat up in the up in the shower at three in the morning you know uh well you know those, <laughs> those are great stories no oh, they uh, are i love them but we're not doing them here <laughs> uh eventually um no i'll, I'll tell a, a very wholesome story um of a good friend of mine who unfortunately is no longer with us um which really saddens me because he would be thriving in this independent wrestling boom. But uh, a a kid named Shane Smalls, um, we worked a lot in Nashville. Uh, I worked with him so much at USWO and Saul, and he was just a wonderful human being. And when I was doing the IWA Deep South stuff, Uh um, he would say, hey, hey, you want to ride with me down? We were going to Sylacauga, Alabama you don't know where that's at i didn't know where it was it's somewhere I'm gonna south guess of it's somewhere yeah somewhere near the gulf if i had to guess it's in between birmingham and the gulf somewhere and um nobody wanted to ride with smalls on one of these trips so i was like oh yeah i'll ride with you so he he doubles back an hour and a half to come get me gets me and then we start driving and he was just a wonderful person to talk to. And, and what was fun was he, he said, all right, let's start listening to music, reach behind my seat underneath my seat or underneath the car seat, pull out my CD case on the third page, middle row, pull out that CD. Like he knew specifically which CD he wanted. So I get back there and pull it out. And uh, it's Hanson. So, you know, we started singing Hanson and then he goes, and then he goes, okay. Uh, uh, fifth page, top right corner. My well, man's was, got his CD case on shuffle. Dude. Yeah. He had it, back when you had like those big binders for CD. I've cases. still got one in my closet right now. Yeah. And the next one was spice girls, spice world. And we just played that whole album and it was such a fun experience that he and I, bonded over our love of 90s pop music right okay so anybody that knows me i am a classic rock oldies rock hard rock aficionado that's my bread and butter mm-hmm. however i have the biggest soft spot for 90s pop music i'm a huge spice girls fan and so yeah give me that look all you want spice girls are awesome uh so that was just a great memory of us driving through Alabama singing nineties pop and then getting very excited when we discovered a Whataburger uh, in Alabama. Oh my God. I don't know why that's so funny. To me. It's, it, it was amazing because you're, you're literally picturing me uh, singing Spice Girls. Uh, fun fact, this still happens on current day road trips. Uh, cause if I'm in, if it's my car, uh, driver chooses the music shotgun shots are K Cole. So Damn if straight. I'm, so if I want to sing queen, uh, live in Montreal, the entire concert, you're going to hear me sing it. If you want to hear me sing uh, spice girls, you're going to hear it. I, I, I will never. 
Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm uh, never going to want to hear you sing Spice Girls. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen one day. Oh, my Lord. And you're going to you go, stop right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, you know I'm not i'm not ashamed to say how much i lo- if you want to know my my absolute go-to 90s pop song that makes me feel better don't you knife hand me um <laughs> when i'm in a bad mood uh my favorite pop song to hear is uh steal my sunshine by lynn it is go. to me that takes me back to a happy place like 1999 uh watching wwf and having dunkaroos and a mondo drink in my room watching slime time live on nickelodeon amazing time you know this the the story about the the songs singing in the car ride reminds me of uh this story uh involves the song kiss from a rose by seal and al snow we're up at uh, a theme park up here in gurney illinois called six flags great america uh we were doing a show over the fourth of july uh and al snow is friends with the, the good good friends with the promoter that that uh, was putting on the show at six flags it was like a paid show on the third and the fourth and like the fifth of july whatever and we, you know, we'd go do the show and we, we'd have like two or three shows a day, you know, like three or four, five matches, whatever. And uh, we get done with all the shows. And afterwards, we had ticket vouchers for for the uh, for the park. And it's nighttime and we're running around and we get to one of the rides, the Batman ride that was themed after the the, the 1989, um, the, the Michael Keaton Batman. It's so, a good one. So um, you, as you're going through the queue, they're playing various songs and, and you know music from the from the Batman movies, and we're standing there getting ready to load, and uh, it's me, it's my buddy Tristan Hayes, it's Al and his wife, and uh, we're we're standing there in the queue, and all of a sudden we just hear ba da 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 da. Da, 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 da. And, uh, and and I just kind of look at, at my friend Justin. We just both start going into it. We do the full on verse. No shame. People are looking at us. And we, do you know when it snows? My eyes. And as we're leading into the chorus, I just, I go, come on, Al. And Al starts singing right. And we are belting Seal's Kiss from a Rose in the middle of the queue, right as we're about to get on the ride in front of God and everybody. And to this day, it probably happened three or four years ago. We will still talk about and reference that like at least once a month that it happened. And just, I wish we had filmed it because the absurdity absurdity of the situation was just off the charts, but still one of my favorite memories in wrestling. Having, having worked with Al Snow multiple times, I literally, I literally know, and I can picture this in my head that he would give you like this deadpan look and then immediately go right into it. I, oh, dude, ask him about it the next time you see him. Ask him about singing Kiss from a Rose in Chicago with Tristan Hayes. And, and, and he'll, he'll probably, probably know. He'll probably remember. He'll look at me like, how do you know that story? Yeah, the rough. <laughs> and and that'll be, that'll be it. But, um, you know, I think uh, with, with that being said, um, I think probably now is a good time to call it a, call it a, a show. And... Uh, probably come back to this at, uh, in another episode we'll we'll talk some more about uh more of life and wrestling and you know obviously like we said at the beginning of the show we're doing a titanic episode and we might even do with some other crazy stuff off the wall but uh jesse man um if uh if you want to call it a night i'm i'm good to call it a night yeah, I'm definitely good to call it a night. Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to this. It's finding little projects and endeavors like this. It's keeping the 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 wrestling fun for me because I never thought I'd be you know 
doing stuff like this. I thought it was just going to be some schmuck of a referee. Oh, no, you're still some schmuck of a referee. It's just now you're well, a yeah, no, no. <laughs> But, it, you know, never thought it never thought I'd be doing fun stuff with people like this. It's just I, it, it's I'm still having a blast doing it. And, and if we get to talk about wrestling stories or talk with other wrestling people about singing horrible karaoke songs, you know, I just. I want more of this. I Sir, I would take first place if I were a karaoke singer. I'm just telling you right now. As you get I, okay, I don't know. Um, uh, our our sweet sweet little Chris Levin. Um, he we may have to sing. get him on. We may have to get him on here and throw down. We might yeah. have to, Chris. You know what? We're throwing the gauntlet down. At some point, we're doing a karaoke night, and and you better be here. I'll drop some Eminem on you or something. <laughs> uh I, i'd almost want to throw adam galt in here too because uh going back and forth between the uh, the venue and the hotel chris and adam rode with me in my car and there were multiple occasions where Baby something would come up my car. <laughs> something would come up because i had my playlist going and i'd look over and Lots adam spice and... girls i'm sure no no surprisingly <laughs> surprisingly uh i would look over and i'd see adam just kind of like rocking his like yeah it's a good song um fastballs out of my head was something he hadn't heard in forever the moment it came out he's like oh man he reaches over turns it up chris is in the back singing it was just a good time hell yeah man well all right man i until next time i will catch you on the flip side once again you know what actually scratch that before we go we should probably plug our social media so people can keep up with us jesse where can we find you uh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all Jesse the Ref. Hey, you know what? That sounds familiar as well. I am Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find me at Jeremy the Ref. Uh, so with that being said, Jesse, have a good night. To everybody watching, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, to watch and listen to us ramble about anything and nothing at all. And uh, uh, good. have a pleasant evening. <laughs>